Greetings everybody. The Joker movie that premiered earlier last month had a lot of hype around this film. I decided to look into how Joker would fit into the Enneagram and what personality type he most resembles. Just as a warning, this review is not spoiler free for those who haven't seen the movie and care about that sort of thing. For those who aren't familiar with the Enneagram, it is a nine-pointed star which represents nine different personality types based on their fears and ambitions. What I found is that Joaquin Phoenix's Joker character most closely resembles an unhealthy type 4, which is sometimes referred to as the artist, the creative, the romantic, or the individualist. Type 4 has a deep fear of being without identity often using creative means to express their complex inner world. They are looking to understand their purpose in life and are often idealistic with intense emotions. They can often be moody, self-absorbed, and melancholy. Arthur Fleck suffers from many delusions throughout the film to the point where the viewer doesn't really know what is real and what is not, because the viewer is experiencing the film from the point of view of Arthur Fleck, who is an unreliable narrator. Even though the viewer is made aware of his delusional state, the viewer can never really tell what is real and what is not. The viewer is experiencing the warped internal reality that Fleck has projected onto the outside world. The viewer, in a sense, is forced to accept that warped view of reality because this is the only perspective that they get. Everything in the film may in fact be a delusion. Gotham itself may not be a real place, and people like Thomas Wayne may be made up completely. There may be some kernels of truth that parallel his real life, but the viewer isn't given enough information to make sense of any of it from a realistic point of view. There are many inconsistencies throughout which lets the viewer know that this is a constructed reality inside of Arthur Fleck's head. For example, at the beginning of the film, one of Fleck's co-workers gives him a gun. Later it falls out of his pocket while he was on the job, and his boss fires him and says that he was told that Arthur tried to buy one off that co-worker. Nobody just gives a guy like Arthur a gun. The fact that his boss tells him on the phone that he knows he was trying to buy a gun lets you know that he was actively looking for a gun and it simply wasn't just given to him. He probably bought it if a gun even existed at all. Another example is that this is supposedly in the era of the 1970s where there is color television but when he goes to see Thomas Wayne at the theater the audience is watching a black and white Charlie Chaplin movie like it's a new film even though it was produced in the 1930s. The therapist he speaks to at the beginning of the film is similar to the therapist at the end of the film. The therapist in the last scene looks as though she is wearing modern clothes and has a modern hairstyle so the film might actually be taking place in modern times and everything that was shown previously was a construction of Arthur's imagination while sitting inside the white room. It's hard to tell because the viewer isn't given very much information to go off of. This narrative style is similar to an old German silent film called The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari from 1920. The film is basically told from the perspective of a person in a mental institution who is relaying a story to one of his fellow inmates about how he got into the institution. At the end of the film, the viewer discovers that the story he told was the ravings of a madman. There could be some elements that were true, but almost nothing he said could be relied upon because the little information we're given displays a wild distortion of reality. There is a movement going on to make people accept other people's internal reality, no matter how distorted it is. Lurking behind this is a sense of desire for authenticity of the inner self. This is a desire to be exceptional and creative, but their existence is defined by what is lacking in those areas. For these types of people, longing is more important than having. Suffering is elevated to a virtue and is seen as something noble. The film's director said that it was a response to the so-called woke cancel culture of the left. What underpins this is the idea of envy and masochism. This masochistic, self-defeating personality is a person who expresses somber emotions, pessimism, dark skepticism, and feels that they are always at the bottom, and as a result they deny life itself. For this type of person, everything is somewhat rotten, but they will often hide their melancholy by manifesting joy and hypomanic activity as a way of escaping their sadness. 
In many ways, they are always playing and joking as a way to boost themselves out of depression. Oftentimes, there is a preoccupation with aesthetics in relation to their melancholy. The way that they dress and the lifestyle they lead are very important, which can lead to presumptuousness and victim consciousness. Once a person feels that they are a victim, they feel justified in doing things that would normally be considered wrong. They become fanatical in their pessimism and seem to want to invite new failures into their lives. This is what is behind the clown mask and Arthur Fleck's strange laugh that sounds more like crying. Even though it is a tortured laugh, it denotes a deranged reward system that is built into the masochistic personality. With every failure, Arthur gets a dopamine reward that is positive by confirming and validating his suffering. A masochistic person has their own distorted value system. It is a way of expressing accusations and vindictiveness in a disguised form. They exaggerate and invite suffering in order to justify demands for affection, reparations, and control. The suffering, self-effacing, and self-destructive feelings they have incorporated into their identity impedes a healthy striving for growth, expansiveness, and even self-glorification because that would be destructive to their self-image. Essentially, they use their depression as a weapon, as a means of exacting revenge on those that they feel have wronged them, such as their families and even society itself. By exaggerating their plight, they are able to avoid their own responsibility for the situation they find themselves in. The masochist is able to place added burdens upon others and make other people take care of them while making them feel guilty in the process. There are people wearing clown masks in the backdrop of the film who are protesting wealth inequality in Gotham. They were inspired by the rumors going around that three wealthy men were killed by a mysterious man, a.k.a. Arthur, in a clown suit on the subway and are holding up signs that are very reminiscent of the leftist group Antifa. Some of the signs were calling Thomas Wayne a fascist, protesting greed in the capitalist system, as well as signs that say, Eat the Rich, which is all very reminiscent of Antifa rhetoric. The Joker supporters are also wearing clown masks, which are reminiscent of the Guy Fox masks that have become synonymous with the group Anonymous. It also bears some similarities to the bandanas that Antifa wears to cover their faces. There is a desire to merge with a person or power that is perceived to be greater than oneself. This is why the protesters wear the clown masks. The masks give them an amenity so that they can more easily merge with the group and achieve a sort of hive mind. By achieving this hive mind, they feel as though they can attain the love, acceptance, and rewards that they feel they are entitled to. They are envious of the things that others possess that they feel lacking in. They secretly wish that they could live lives that they perceive as being more simple. They wish they could attain qualities of other people that they perceive as having privilege, whether it's gender or social status. By the end of the movie, the clown-masked protesters are only intent on causing nihilistic destruction. There is no point to their destruction except destruction itself. This is the same path that Antifa is headed down and has already reached that point in many ways. Fleck imagines that he is the Joker and their leader. He is the depressive psychopath. Joker has a vanity toward presenting the illusion that he is content and happy and has achieved the simplicity that he so desires. He is also on a lot of medications which help him attempt to present as a normal person. He does a very poor job of this though as he is very unstable and misunderstands a lot of how social interactions actually work. Fleck's relationship with his mother can be described as what is termed as the oral aggressive character or oral pessimistic character. This is essentially a narcissistic aspect of Fleck's character that is rooted in the symbolic loss of his mother's breast. This works to undermine feelings of love and gratitude since it affects the earliest relationship that one can have, that of the mother. Envy builds up within Fleck instead of love and gratitude. Viewing his mother as evil becomes a preoccupation as a result. Fleck not only wants to drain the resources of his mother, but also poison her in a sense. 
He wants to poison her by putting the bad aspects of himself into her. There is a scene where he goes to Arkham Asylum and steals his mother's records, which I believe may be a delusion, and what is contained in the file is actually a description of himself as being an abusive narcissist. In the film he is depicted as taking care of her, but it very well may be the other way around, and she was the one who was actually taking care of him. When he discovers that he is supposedly an orphan and that he was tied to a radiator, it gave him the justification to hate and kill her. He was able to get the victim status that he was looking for. This also developed into envy of Thomas Wayne as having the masculine role, and Fleck begins to stalk him. Fleck approaches Thomas Wayne and wants Wayne to show him love and decency and calls him dad. When Fleck discovers Wayne is not his father, and told that his mother suffers from delusions, it prompts him to go to Arkham to steal the records. Like I said, all this could be a complete delusion of Flex, including his meeting with Thomas Wayne, but it does fit the pattern of a person who is of an envious masochistic character. Love for Arthur is an idealistic affair because he misunderstands what love actually is. His expectations and needs create far too great a dependency on others to be realistic. Love for Arthur is to merge with the other person, and in this merger he seeks to find a unity that he cannot find within himself. This is why the only relationship that works for him in the film is completely imaginary, that of the girl he met in the elevator, and even then he scares her by going into her apartment uninvited, soaking wet after being in the rain. He displays a helplessness which manifests as a motivational inability to take proper care of himself. This feeling of helplessness may be an unconscious maneuver to attract protection. His loss of his medication due to budget cuts may have been a motivation to get close to Thomas Wayne because of his financial situation. He wanted Wayne to show him some love because he is known to have a lot of money and therefore Fleck would somehow be cared for. Arthur is also desperate for approval from strangers. He fantasized about going on the Murray Franklin show and screams, I love you, and Murray says, I love you too, and invites him down on stage where Murray tells him that he would give up his life in show business to have a kid like you. Arthur goes to the comedy club regularly and takes notes on the jokes that people tell, even though he doesn't quite understand what is funny about the jokes as indicated by his awkward laughing at the wrong moments. He finally goes on stage to tell his own jokes and bombs. Someone had captured the footage on videotape and it ended up on the Murray Franklin show. Murray Franklin made some jokes at his expense, but later invited Arthur onto his show. When accepted onto the show, it was like Arthur was given approval and was happy about it at first, but then he looked for reasons to be wronged. When Arthur makes his appearance on the show, he tells a morbid knock-knock joke that nobody in the audience likes, and then admits to killing the three men in business suits on the subway. It's hard to tell whether the people on the train he killed were actually being mean to a woman, or Fleck was simply projecting his presumptions onto them. He says that if it were him, nobody would care, that they would walk right over him. Arthur then says that Thomas Wayne is insensitive and would never think about what it would be like to be a guy like him. Murray Franklin says, so much self-pity. Arthur gets angry with Murray because he made fun of him on a previous episode and said he was just like the rest of the people he finds awful. Murray says that he should be grateful for being on his show and there are so many other comedians who work hard who would rather be there but Arthur can't find reasons to be grateful because he is too focused on the negative. This is the pattern for an unhealthy type 4 individual. They desire to be the center of attention and to be loved, but when they actually get the recognition that they want, they become bitter and try to find fault with what they have. The satisfaction that they receive leaves them feeling empty and shallow because their existence is defined by what is lacking. Once that pattern is broken, they feel lost and don't know what to do when their suffering has ended. Arthur Fleck inwardly cultivates his pain because his definition of love is to be dependent in pursuit of care and empathy. 
There are two instances where Arthur Fleck is thrown to the ground and kicked while he is on the ground. Once at the beginning of the film when the young hooligans steal his sign, and once while he's on the subway, which indicates that this is a fantasy that he has about being beaten and kicked while he is down. Arthur might as well wear a sign that says, Please don't kick me, which translates to, My misfortunes are better than yours. Not only does this invite abuse, but it also allows him to play victim and get what he wants from people. At the end of the film, he fantasizes about Bruce Wayne's parents being killed and Bruce standing over their lifeless bodies. I think that this is a fantasy of Arthur's because Bruce now understands pain just like Arthur. Arthur revels in this suffering because then Bruce will understand what it feels like to be a broken person. All of the clocks are set to 11.11 and this appears three times in the early part of the film. Once near the beginning when talking to a therapist, again in a flashback to him being locked up in a white room while banging his head. The third is when he punches the roster clock after he's fired from his job. If you look up the meaning of 1111, you'll get a lot of videos and websites talking about if these numbers show up, you're going to go through a change period in your life and you will emerge as your true self. This idea is reinforced by the scene where Arthur climbs into his refrigerator it is like a caterpillar climbing into a cocoon and emerging as a butterfly. A transformation has taken place. He goes into the fridge as Arthur and emerges as the Joker. He accepts who he now is. He feels that he doesn't have to answer to anybody for who he is. He doesn't have to apologize for his jokes because he is the Joker.